everyone. Welcome. I'm Devorah Enton. I'm the clinical consultant with Yesh Tikva. I am thrilled to join you in a conversation with two um, fantastic therapists. I have with me Hani Delman and Michael Bleicher, both of whom have worked very closely with the infertility and the pregnancy loss communities. And I've invited them here today to discuss a little bit about the work with couples and what it's like to um, navigate this world of infertility as an individual, as well as a couple, and what that feels like from the therapist chair. And what are the things that we almost uh, kind of wish others understood or the highlighted issues that we're hearing from the couples that we are working with. So before we begin, Hani Delman, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, Tavora. Thank you so much for having me on tonight. Thank you, Yish Tikva, for putting this out and really educating so many out there. My name is Hani Delman. I'm a clinical social worker. I have a private practice in the five towns in Queens. I specialize in perinatal mood disorders, loss and bereavement, and infertility. I volunteer for Kinafayim, a um, infancy and pregnancy loss support groups. I run some of their support groups and I'm on the clinical board of Magee, New York. Welcome, Michael Bleicher. Thank you, Devar. My name is Michael Bleicher. I am a, also a clinical social worker and I am privileged to host a monthly support group for men through Yesh Kikba for men who are struggling with infertility um, in various stages, primary, secondary, also affiliated with Bone Olam as a uh, therapist who sees couples who are struggling towards the end of their journey with Bone Olam and looking forward to see what other options might be available as they try to grow their family. Um, I also specialize in supporting couples who are struggling with infertility and reproductive loss and perinatal mood and anxiety disorders, not yet PMHC, but have completed postpartum support internationals uh, advanced training and looking forward to getting that certified in the year ahead. And it's really Amazing. a privilege to be with both of you this, today. Thank you so much. And I feel like I'm like sitting in a room with friends and a posse of like the experts in the room. So this is really exciting. So let's start off with, um, Hani, I think I'm gonna start with you. If we could talk a little bit about what do you identify as like the number one concern that you are noticing with couples who are struggling with infertility? What is their biggest issue that they are dealing with? So I guess I the biggest, I mean, there's biggest in terms of the couple and then there's biggest in terms of the couple versus the rest of the world. So I'll start with couple and the rest of the world, I think um, is, the whole idea of people, how they're looked at, being pitied, being people caring, how much people are asking um, versus not asking, you know, being asked to be a kvats or at a bris, right? Do they want to for the 10th time be give, given that honor um, at the circumcision to carry in the baby? Um, do they want their parents knowing things? Do they not? Do they want to share? So that's more on the couple. I guess, verse or, you know, in connection with their community and their family around them. And in terms of the couple, I think it's really just supporting each other. Um, I think learning to support each other and how to support each other. Obviously with in infertility, there are so many different aspects of it. Um, you know, what the, the, the primary diagnosis problem um, issue medical complication is, and then how do we support each other through this? What is my, and a lot of the work I do with the couple in session is what does my partner need from me and how do I communicate that need? Um, what do I need from them? What do they need from me? And very much usually, and, you know, um, we'll discuss this tonight, being such different needs and just learning that. And what about you, um, Michael? What are some of your concerns uh, that you're noticing? Maybe if you wanna take the men's perspective, if you would identify the primary thing that the male is dealing with, aside from whatever the diagnosis is, but what are you hearing from the men when it comes to the couple struggle? So I will echo everything that Hani said um, in terms of being in the limelight when they are offered to be the kvater. And it's not just at a friend's bris, but it's also, how does this impact my family? So if my brother or my sister is making a bris and I wanna be part of that celebration, but I myself have just suffered a pregnancy loss or got bad news 
the last time we went to the reproductive endocrinologist. And I'm not really up to putting myself out there in a way that's going to shine a spotlight on me and my wife. We're just not ready for that. Um, or they try and they, they muster all the courage that they can and they break down crying in public. And they feel like I'm never going to another bris again or I'm never going to the next family gathering because they're, they feel humiliated, they feel embarrassed when all of those feelings are really very valid, but now everybody knows that there's something going on that maybe is a little deeper than they thought. Um, and so that's a challenge that, you know, trying to walk that tightrope of men usually feel like they need to be strong and they feel like they need to be strong for themselves versus um, compared to their outside community as well as to their family. And they also feel like they need to be strong for their wives. And what that means is that they're not going to express themselves. They're not going to express the pain that they're feeling. They don't have a good sense of trust to be able to turn to a friend, even though their wife has already spoken to their friend's wife and they know what's going on, but the husband doesn't feel emotionally safe sharing that and looking for support uh, with somebody else. He doesn't feel safe expressing something to his wife because he's afraid that perhaps if he says that he's in pain, then she's not going to be able to manage his pain because she's, he knows that she's managing her pain. And so that might be too much for her. Uh, but we know that in fact, research shows that women are craving that response, that expression. They wanna know that their husbands have feelings. They want their husbands to know that it's okay to share periodically in a way that you know, they can handle it because they're both on this journey together. And so there's a lot of isolation, both, you know, I like the way Hani framed it as there's isolation within the couple and there's isolation within the broader community to say nothing of, my mother keeps asking me, my mother's pressuring my, my wife, uh, you know, Rebbe, rabbis, mentors, other people are asking questions that are really private and really nobody else's business, but there's a lot of pressure and they don't necessarily have a good outlet of how to express it, how to learn how to cope with it, how to ask for better coping skills until now it becomes a strain, not only on them, um, in terms of the diagnosis, which is a medical diagnosis, but it also begins to impact them individually, psychologically, and could create some real fractured uh, points within the marriage. Okay, I think about like one of the things that you, you brought up that idea of like, uh, if, I, if I disclose my sadness to my wife, if she knows just how hard this is for me as well, then I am going to have to then be concerned about how she's receiving that information. I feel like then I'm not being protective of her feelings. And mm -hmm. yet it, we have consistently understood from women in particular, and we're doing a real stereotypical dynamic, you know, in a relationship, right? So in a real stereotyping of, of the dynamic, the, the wife is the one who says, please share with me your feelings. And he says, no, I'm going to take care of your feelings and make sure that as long as you're okay, then I don't, don't worry about my feelings. And the wife is saying, please share with me your feelings because it helps me feel connected, supported. I, I feel like you're, we're in this together rather than you're over there taking care of me. Um, it's, it's just a, it's such a fascinating kind of confusion within a relationship. What are some of the ways that you might um, address that? And how do you convince a couple that, no, it really is a good idea to share with your wife. Like she really wants to know this. No, for real, for real. Like, honey, what are some of the ways that you connect them? In conversation. Yeah. Um, it's such a great question. I think in in the context of the couple, um, especially with infertility, sometimes in, in couples therapy, we're kind of waiting for, as a couples therapist, I'm waiting for them to bring things up. With infertility, I might go ahead and bring things up that they might not. What are you guys feeling about this? How are you dealing with this? Because of that stigma, what can I talk about? How am I going to be a, it be addressed? It's a little bit of a different feel than a couple coming in with a conflict or crisis. So I might bring that up and ask them how they already go about it and how they want to go about it and how maybe just like talking about different ways, how can you guys do this just a little differently that really does give support to each other. Um, usually that opening allows for them to just feel like, oh, like a little bit of a relief. Like I want him to know that, you know, I'm okay hearing his, his stuff, even if I'm in pain, that's a big, big one, right? Even if I'm in pain, even if I'm going through a lot, like I also want to know what's going on with you. Um, and really, I think a real 
critical points is that for them to know the more they keep from each other, the more they keep from each other, the more that will disconnect them and not bring them together. And so that even if it's painful or difficult or something you're not sure of, that the more that's just shared and, and, and open and the transparency in the relationship, the more it, it's just easier to work through, easier to hold each other and give them the tools to be able to do that. What do you do with the, you know, that comment that, but let's say, for example, we've identified that it's female factor in fertility, right? So if the male um, shares his distress, sadness, emotion relating to the, the relationship, uh, relating to infertility and not having children yet, you know, there could be a strong sense of like, I don't want her to feel blamed, right? Or ashamed that she is the one that has the primary diagnosis, right? And she's gonna quickly say, no, but you have to understand if it was the opposite, of course I would never feel that way, right? They're quick to like flip the script. But how do we help people get beyond that shame piece and that awareness of, of kind of, I think we, you each have brought up that term shame or embarrassment um, in, a, in a public light, but it's also something that people are clearly internalizing in a personal story. What are some of the ways that each of you address the shame component of the diagnosis of infertility? So Go I ahead, Michael. To, Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I try to help the men understand that this isn't about blaming, right? Nobody wins by, we, we can say that it's male factor or female factor infertility, but both of you are on this journey. Both of you are committed to growing your family. And so just like it's nobody's fault, and we're not going to blame one person over the other, one person needs more medical support than the other, but we're not blaming anybody. So too, there's no reason to feel ashamed. Your body didn't fail you in any way. It's not that you did something that you deserve this. You know, oftentimes it gets into questions of what did I do? Why is God blaming me for this? You know, is there something that I could have done better? Is there something that I could be doing better right now? And those are you know, sometimes helpful, sometimes unhelpful questions, which we can get into, but helping them understand that ultimately this isn't about blaming or shaming. This is about how can I support one another? The challenge sometimes uniquely for men is that to begin with, especially when it's female factor infertility, but even when it's male factor, the bulk of medical interventions are focused on the new wife. And so in that case, especially with COVID continuing to be an issue in a medical setting, the husbands are feeling, you know, very detached. They're not able to enter the building. They're not, they feel like a, an onlooker. And so they sometimes hear about what their wife experienced when they come home, but they don't feel like they're by her side because they're physically distant. They're not able to be next to her. They're not in the room with her, supporting her, seeing her nonverbal reactions to what the doctor is saying and, and how painful the procedures may be. And so the more that we can try and bring that up and let them know that this is something that we wanna be, be able to do together. We wanna to be able to support one another, regardless of you know, who the primary diagnosis is and regardless of who's in the office, this is really something that for your sake, so that you know, you're gonna get through this one way or another, how can we maintain the strength of your marriage? Because that's what brought you together and we wanna be able to preserve that because you'll be more effective research actually shows that the more, the closer emotionally that a husband and wife are, the more successful assistive reproductive technology and treatment can be. And so we want to be able to highlight the, the benefits of the hard emotional work and investment that they're putting into it. Yeah. Honey, what are your thoughts about the shame and the, and the blame piece? So I think first, it's really important to give space for it. You know, we could be quick to maybe like the rest of the world might be to them. No, it's not your fault. It's meant to be. Um, so there needs to be a bit of space. And I think that's as therapists, I think that's always our role to give space for it, to let them process it, to let them talk about it, to let them talk about the unfairness of it, very much bringing up um, the faith-based um, questions. And then once they always wait. <laughs> like once I feel that they've really gotten it out, um, can then we can go into obviously that that's not so, so helpful to stay in that place. What's our next move? How are we moving forward from this? How are you unifying as a couple? How are you bringing your faith into it, into it recognizing that this is something you didn't choose? Um, everyone having their package 
and this is yours and now what are we doing with it and I think just like Michael said really really then pushing and leading them into strengthening their relationship and strengthening the marital bonds within it and giving them that space to be able to express to each other where they're at what's going on um you know even again not being able to go into the hospital it's, it's, it's covid's brought brought a whole nother level of issues to the infertility as well as everything world. So being able to address those is really, really critically important. Um, and, and helping them put it down. Like, I guess one of the, the terms I always use is, can you leave it in here this week? Like, can you put down some of that shame? Because it's heavy. Um, and sometimes just giving that permission is very powerful. It doesn't, it's a choice you're making to carry it around on your shoulders. And especially taking your partners trying to write. So if it's uh, a female factor, then the man trying to like, oh, let me hold hers, let me hold hers um, and vice versa. So just trying to help them in different ways, put it down. That idea of conceptualizing into something that's actually tangible. Um, speaking of on the more practical levels. I, I, I sometimes, hear... just to build on that, I sometimes ask the couple to look at something in the office and really identify so that there's a really tangible object in the office that they can say, that's where I'm leaving it, or in that corner over there. And so it allows them, you know, a little bit of distance. And they leave the office and each one can support the other by saying, we left it in the corner. We're going to come back to it next time. Yeah, right. Right. I love that. And thinking about it from a very practical way, you know, one of the things that I think we, it's, a, it's a value, it's, it's important to us to, to identify some of these challenges that we are having with COVID as much as I'd love to say, I don't want to talk about COVID. But I think that coming up with a couple of minor kind of ideas or suggestions, I know that one of the things that I have brought up again and again with my clients, the idea of like FaceTiming or Skyping or calling your, your, your husband or wife while you're in the medical office in order to just be there together virtually. And they'll look at me and they'll say, oh, I never thought of that. I'm thinking, why, why are we, everything is virtual? Why are we not thinking about it? But yeah, think about it. Like, yes, that person now in theory, I know that there are medical practices that don't allow video conferencing in, but I think that when we're, you know, we can set up with your physician and say, this is what I need. And we strategize a way of where that camera can be so that my husband can be with me, right? I talked about the husband leaving post-it notes in the car, you know, like leave her notes on the mirror in the car, bring her a cup of coffee as she's walking out the door or a cup of hot chocolate, just something that says, I know exactly where you're going today. And I wish I could go with you. And I am, you know, I am connected with you in that way. What are some of the techniques that you've come up with to help couples connect in this scenario right now? That's pretty um, devastating when they cannot be together. Yeah, so that those examples are great. And one thing I really strongly encourage is like a pre and post. So before the procedure, before that morning appointments um, that they have the night out together, that they go on a date, that they just, you know, sit on the couch um, and then post like almost a debriefing. <laughs> If they're not going to be in my office, they got to do it with each other and just being able to really process, be able to talk. She can share, he can share what it was like, what they were going through and just be there to support each other. So that pre and post I find is really a critical piece. Yeah, I think I've offered uh, suggestions of for a wife, if you put something in her purse next to her car key or next to her wallet, she's going to be taking out her insurance card or her driver's license anyway. You know, leave a note, leave a piece of chocolate, something that really reminds her like, oh, he is with me um, and vice versa. If it's the husband going, so put something in his pocket. It's wintertime here in the East Coast and you know, everyone's wearing a coat, put something in the pocket, let them have that just like tangible reminder. Um, and, you know, as Connie said, you know, make sure that there's a communication that's really structured because sometimes if something doesn't go well, so maybe one side will try to avoid it, or if they had a busy day, it's so easy to avoid saying, hey, how'd it go this morning? And we might not have you know, the full reservoir of, of strength to be able to hear it, but in order to maintain that channel of communication, it's really important that you, know, you create a structure either right afterwards, or maybe at the end of the day where they can be face-to-face -face, as they couldn't have been before, um, and part of that, by the way, in terms of FaceTiming and, and WhatsApp and whatever else, 
part of it is the grief and accepting and not accepting, but acknowledging that this is really not ideal. And I would love to be with you. And it pains me that I can't join you. And if this isn't a decision that I'm making, but it's something that, you know, this is where we're at. And so we're going to do the best that we can. And right now, the best that we can is connecting via technology. But maybe tonight, when we both get home from whatever we do during the day, we can sit down together and really talk about it and create that space to support one another and to really be free to express whatever needs to be spoken about. I think that that's like really fantastic marriage advice to anybody, right? Like if you think about it, like anytime a spouse checks in on you, it's like, ooh, brownie points, big brownie points, right? Like, oh, I know you had a hard morning. You know, I was wondering how your morning went and I wonder how your afternoon went. And like, it says, it's more than just like, hey, did you take out the garbage? It's like a real way of connection that we should value um, even if it maybe feels crafted or it might feel like I know the therapist told me to do it, but guess what? It works. It feels good anyways. And I think one thing I would add to that or just kind of a, frame it a, a little bit differently as well is that idea of it's okay to ask for what you need. So either a husband or wife to say, it would be really meaningful to me if you texted me in the morning when I'm on my way to the doctor or when I'm sitting in the, you know, I'd like you to be available if I need to just text you. And I know that you're going to text me back when I'm anxious in the waiting room. Ask, coming up with an idea of what do I need in those high stress moments and then asking for it, because I'm going to go on the assumption that you have a spouse who's compassionate, who doesn't know exactly how to engage with you in these really complex emotional situations. And the biggest gift I think you can give to a marriage is to tell him or her exactly what you need in these complicated times. Um, And so kind of following through on that might be an add value to a relationship. So I'm gonna gonna interrupt for a second there. I'm not quite sure why we don't do it. It's like so many couples. It's it's this belief, idea, fantasy. He should just know what I want. He should know. He right. should if just he know, really he love know. me. He'd know right. what flowers to bring home. Right, right. Exactly. right. And we can <laughs> read each other's minds. And I'm like, it is the biggest gift for yourself. Like, just tell him you want that box of chocolates or just send him out for those flowers. And it doesn't right. take away that it's still a really special thing. Um, and you're just kind of teaching teaching them this is what I need so I think it's super critical in all couples but with you know the difficult conversation we're having and when when things already are difficult in the relationship strained pain emotional you know disconnect they got to amp it up also right so I, I have a question can right? I ask you one? Yeah, yeah Michael I want to ask you that question directly because can <laughs> you I think the women are going to be more clear about the needs that they may have in these high stress scenarios. I need him to text me. I need him to send me a piece of chocolate. What are you hearing from the men that they need? And you can answer whatever other piece, you know, if you want to talk to whatever else was brought up there, but I really want to hear that as well. I think in terms of how they can support their wives, sometimes they feel like she'll tell him a little bit, but it's not enough. Like he needs very clear instructions and he's afraid to ask because he's afraid to just, open up that Pandora's box and who knows if he's gonna be able to meet her needs, but it, he's not gonna be able to get there if he doesn't know, if he doesn't, and if he's guessing and she keeps giving him negative feedback and he feels, well, you know, I'm doing my best and I'm done, I'm gonna, I'm gonna withdraw, I'm gonna shut down. And that's a classic pattern, but it's, that would be really unfortunate. Um, and so empowering him to say, you can ask and maybe you won't be able to meet that need today, but to say, I'm sorry, that doesn't work for me, but here's what I can do instead. Or is there anything else that I can do? Um, In terms of what he needs, I found that a lot of times he's not willing to share or he doesn't necessarily know because there's this like codependency that often bubbles into the relationship where because he's supporting her, he also can't have any needs of his own. And so for him to sit, for me to ask him, well, okay, now that we've heard what she needs, what do you need? And he'll say, I'm good. <laughs> okay, so, we know you're good. You're great. Right. You know, you're everything's awesome. wonderful, right. but you mm-hmm. still have needs and that's okay. And just like you're able to support her, she would love to hear from you because in general, you're not sharing as much about the pain or the emotions that you're feeling. So what can she do? What can she give? What can she show? What can she say? And it's really a very similar conversation but it has to come a little bit slower and really to give him permission to have the needs in the first place. I think 
he presumes that she has the needs, but he's not sure what they are. He doesn't even always connect or realize that he also has emotional needs in order to navigate this journey, which is often, you know, it takes a lot of time and he's not sure what the next step is, but let's just focus on today. What do you need today? How can she support you today? And sometimes it's like there's a long pause until he's able to think about, oh, I'm allowed to have those needs. What are some of the things you're actually hearing from the men that they want? Because I imagine it's different than what the women want. Sometimes they want time to themselves. Um, and, and that's not because they're withdrawing. It's really just because there's so much that they're juggling. They just need some downtime. And they feel like they need to be at their wife's side uh, to support her, but they also just need time to chill and relax in whatever way you know that looks like. For some, it's mowing the grass. For others, it's you know learning with somebody else or reading something. But everybody has their own needs. Um, some of the other needs that have come up is a greater understanding, really, of what his wife is experiencing. Uh, because there's just not a lot of deeper reflection and conversation about what she's experiencing. And so it's not just about chocolate, right? Obviously, the chocolate is just, okay, that, that tastes good. It feels good in the moment. Um, but talking about long-term vision, of, you know, not, and by long-term, I mean like one month. Like, what can we do over the next month together? Here's what I would like to do. This is what I would like to accomplish. And... I have the time, I have the space to be able to do that, even though I am pulled in many different directions, whether it's work or whether it's family responsibilities, but to be able to give himself a little bit of space to do something that's meaningful, aside from being actively engaged in the fertility journey. I like that a lot. And when I'm thinking about that, I'm thinking also about um, how critical it is for just as much as women tend to try to find those more safe spaces to have those conversations in a support group or among friends. Um, sometimes it's a sister, a family member, but the men need it too. Um, the guys really need somebody that they can talk to, that they can get a beer with in whatever stereotypical way we describe it. But that ability to have a brotherhood while we, we identify its value can be incredibly difficult for people to find and to, to create space and time for. Honey, what do you think? I think it's, I think it's just ahead, different ahead. because the, the women often need, want time to grieve what they don't have, and men often don't find that useful. They don't want to talk about their feelings of loss and grief. They want to talk about, okay, what's next? How can I increase my resilience? What can I accomplish while I'm waiting for the next round of treatments? And I think so that, that space is really very different. The doing versus the being. Yeah. And it's not because they're avoiding it, it's because that's just more meaningful. That helps them cope with what they're doing in a different way. Mm -hmm. Something Michael said kind of sparked, it's kind of in a different area, um, but just I think this is so critical to bring up the, you know, spending time together. So I'm again, we're kind of going on a stereotypical, I'm going on a couple that doesn't have kids. Um, I think, you know, second time infertility is, is different because they are busy with the kids then. But when they don't have kids one year, two years, three years, God forbid, there's a very big challenge of spending time together versus spending time apart and dating versus, um, you know, being busy with other things and just finding that balance. I find a lot of couples struggle with um, a lot of guilt comes up with, hey, like you, like Michael brought up, hey, the guy just wanting some time to chill with his friends and sometimes this notion of oh we I guess you know we have all this time and we don't have kids so we should we should really look at this we you know people oh well at least you had this time together right but that's not endless time that's a really big challenge for a lot of couples I work with to just balance that to be honest about it when it's too much how much they're doing with each other a little bit of the codependency is created in that in that in that setting of, I don't, you know, we're not doing anything else. So we should do this together, do this together, do this together. When really, you know, finding a balance of having friends, spending time with family and being together, um, you know, is works through a bit. I think that that really speaks to in the last couple of minutes that we have together, that idea of um, creating an identity independent of having infertility. 
that it, and fertility can become the entire identity that a person experiences in their in their especially in those initial years. And I think one of the things that I've learned the most from certain clients of mine has been the ones that have been able to create an identity totally independent of having infertility. And the ones that are able to do that, I think are the healthiest. You know, they're the ones that I learn more from them than they need from me. And I just, um, I think that that's, it's something that we can't necessarily teach as much as I think there's a certain in, internal resiliency that a person either has or identifies wanting to grow in that ability to say, I have this really big challenge, but it doesn't have to be my entire way that I experience the world, even though it really feels like it's the entire way I experience the world. So, you know, I think just being mindful of that, um, creating a, a personal identity, a couple's identity, and also that couple going through infertility are not necessarily the exact same thing and how important that is. So in the last moments that we have, um, one of the things that you had brought up before is that idea of, you know, impending time. It was something that we had talked about as we were launching the call, that idea of couples um, kind of being nervous, anxious about impending holidays and yantif and, and vacations. And just let's just bring a highlight that, just bring some, some a spotlight to that issue for a moment and any kind of tips or suggestions or um, kind of guidance that you might offer to couples who are listening to this. Ani, you want to start? Yeah, sure. I think that kind of goes along with you know, the same concept of finding balance, right? So I can't, I'm not going to say to a couple, well, just live in the moment because they actually have to plan, right? They have to plan when the treatment's going to start. They have to plan the days, the month, when they're going to go in. You know, many want to do it over summer vacation because then no one knows what's going on because everyone's away. Many people, you know, have Pesach coming up. So wait, what's going to be then? Where am I going to be? When am I going in for this treatment? So from a technical perspective, yeah, you have to plan it. But it's the balance of not being so consumed by it, not letting it take over, not letting it stop everything in your path. And I think that's a technical balance, but it's really an emotional one also, like the different things we've talked about over this call, the ability to say, right now, this is my focus, this is our focus, and we need to sit down and just work out what makes sense. Many times, um, specific clinics only have specific dates for very specific treatments. So then, okay, this is what's being given to us. You know, are we moving forward with this or are we waiting till the next round. Um, and I think the most important thing, again, when I'm with that couple is again, the honesty, the transparency, what they're feeling, not being pressured um, to make these quick decisions, but to really take into consideration just what's going to work for us in these moments or, you know, moments of months or within the context of that year. You know, I think part of the balance that we're talking about is not being consumed by it and not allowing our anxiety about how is that round of treatment going to play out really take over. And what I found helpful is helping couples think about, so maybe the date of the next procedure is not in my control, and right? I might have to wait until that doctor's schedule frees up. But let's say couples are already beginning to plan treatment around Pesach or about, around winter vacation. So now we have a choice, right? Those things about when the doctors are available, that's out of my control. How long I need to wait for the next round, that's also out of my control. But if I wanna have Pesach on my terms or I wanna have vacation on my terms, I can choose to delay that appointment until it works for me because I wanna be in control of the things that are going on in my life to the extent that I can. And so giving, back, giving them back that choice and that power and autonomy over their schedule, over their vacations over a big part of their lives often helps them find a little bit more space to feel less anxious about it. And they go into it with a freer sense of self because they've had that vacation. They've been able to recharge. They've given themselves the gift that they need to be able to go in, you know, full steam ahead, energized, motivated, um, empowered, rather than feeling like the doctors or the organizations that are helping them are in control of their destiny. I think that's so important. And I'm going to finish it up with a, an idea that I had heard from another therapist. Um, we had talked about like going on a vacation or planning something. 
And I said, you know, it's just so frustrating because, you know, you plan, you buy a ticket and then the, you get canceled. You know, Israel closes their borders and the, the show you wanted to see, they shut down for COVID. And, you know, you keep planning and they keep collapsing. And she said to me, you know, it's so courageous to continue to plan. And I keep on thinking about that word that every time I plan for something, I said, oh, it takes a lot of courage to do this, but I can be courageous. That is, a, that is an identity that I would love to own, to be courageous in my planning. And so I've taken to that idea of, can I plan something, even if I have to cancel it, but I've planned something. And I think especially in, you know, COVID is, is an experience that is oh so similar to those that are going through fertility, where the world shuts down around them, where everything is may or may not be available, where everything changes month to month and I can't plan anything. And I think it takes courage to step one month in front of the other, one month after the next, one treatment after the next. It takes courage to do that. Um, and sometimes it feels like, well, I have no choice because I want to have a baby, but it still takes courage to step in those doors. And I think that we can learn from that concept of it takes courage to plan something, a vacation, a day, a trip, a something, a night out, even if it gets canceled and have to be rescheduled, but to identify and to kind of step into that space of I can be courageous, because I think that really is the essence of who these individuals are, who these couples can become or can be even in light of, or in the face of incredible, incredible challenges. So I'd like to thank each of each of you for participating and sharing. I know we could have spoken for at least another hour, but I'm going to let you go. Um, thank you for sharing this conversation with me as a part of our um, Tikva Talk series. And um, thank you and have a great evening, everyone.